So, uh, my name is Eivin, and I'm here today to talk about how we're automatically categorizing articles on nrk.no. So, I'm from Norway, where I work at a company called NRK. And NRK is the Norwegian broadcaster. So, it's like the Norwegian equivalent to the BBC. I guess you have something like that here in Poland as well. Short about me, uh, Eivin Holmstad. I'm the team lead of the recommendation team at NRK. I have a background in computer science and has been working there for five years. And today, unfortunately, I have a cold. So if you, I might need to cough a bit in the microphone. Apologize in advance. So I work at NRK, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. And we are the biggest media house in Norway. We have three TV channels, four national radio channels, and some services online. And it's our goal that four out of five people in Norway should use our content daily. Uh, and to do that, we need to offer a unique breadth of content. So our goal is to have something for everyone at all times. And now I need to give you a little warning. Uh, this pre presentation will contain some traces of Norwegian, but I've tried to translate the most important parts. And the reason that it contains some traces of Norwegian is that uh, this is about articles from Norway on the Norwegian newspaper, online newspaper. So we write them in Norwegian. I mean, uh, uh, the NRK technology division. And our goal is to ensure that NRK is as relevant in the future as it is today. Uh, and to do that, we don't uh, no longer only uh, use linear TV channels and radio channels, but we also have apps. So we have the newspaper, NRK.no. It's the second biggest uh, online newspaper in Norway. We have a weather app called IR. It's the fifth biggest web, web, weather service in the world, actually. It's really big in South Africa for some reason. And we have a, uh, an arcade TV, the online streaming service. Uh, our biggest competitor is, of course, Netflix. And we have NRK Radio. But today we're going to talk mostly about that newspaper and this topic. How can we automatically categorize articles? And the reason I want to categorize articles, I work in the recommendation team, and we want to provide recommendations of relevant content in context of other content. So in this example, you can see we have one article about Sigri, which is going on tour, on tour with Maroon 5. Another uh, a good recommendation from that might be an article about Beyonce. And we, if we had good categorization of articles, we could know this one is about music, this one is also about music, use it as a recommendation. But more interesting is that we can use categories to build user profiles, which in turn can be used to give personal recommendations. So this guy, for instance, is into football and recipes. And we can learn this. If we have a good categorization, we can see what type of content he consumes and build on top of that. But now you might ask, don't you already have manual cat categories? Isn't that a standard feature of any CMS? And you are right about that, but there's still some problems with it. Problem number one is that we have something called article collections. So you can take your news articles and group them together in a collection. But uh, those collections have been abused again and again by our journalists. This first one, this first use case, that's actually something that I would like to use them for. You can group articles by topic. So here we have topics like travel and tourism, the Church of Norway, a famous skier called Petter Nordtug. These are great, great categories as well. But we also use those collections to publish content on special pages. So this one in front here is our page for foreign affair news. And in order to get the article on the foreign affair front page, you need to put it in the foreign affair article collection. And then there's this. We use the same article to collection to group articles by news events. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, someone 
Some journalists created the financial crisis article collection. Uh, so this is not a topic, this is like an event or something that happens in a specific uh, time period. And a lot of other weird stuff. So if you could, would know Norwegian, you would laugh at these slides because these are really strange uh, categories. But the point is that if you build a feature for one purpose, which is possible of to abuse for other purposes, it will eventually be abused. And that's just how users are. Even though they're professional journalists, that's how it is. We have some other problems as well. We have a lot of duplicate article collections about the same topic. So in this slide, there's a lot of Norwegian again. But if you understand that fisk is the Norwegian word for fish, and Finnmark is the most northern county in Norway. So, this is an article collection about fish in fin Finnmark. Another one, another one, another one. Fish, fish, fish. Actually, there's a whole bunch of them. All about fishery in Norway. And the reason this happens is that uh, the article coll collection is actually just a free text field which lacks good search. And uh, if the journalists can't find the article collection they're looking for, they're just creating a new one. And the last problem is that our collections have uh, different abstraction levels. So the foreign affair one has L over because all articles about foreign affairs will be put into this uh, collection. There's over 11,000 of them. But there's also some very small collections with less than that. So actually we have 1,200 collections with only one article in them and almost 5,000 collections with five or less. Um, and the sum of all these problems is that our article connect collections are not fit for recommendations or for building user profiles. And one way to fix this would be to just uh, fix those collections, use them in a better way. But then you would have to learn 500, tell 500 journalists how to do their job better and rewrite the CMS system. And as I work as, a, as an engineer and data scientist, that, that's not the approach that we took. We said that instead the computer can categorize articles for us. And categorizing is uh, basically the same as classification. And classification is something that can be done with supervised learning a machine learning technique. Okay, here's two simple facts. First, articles are mostly paragraphs of text. And second fact, supervised learning algorithms prefer to work with numbers. Which means that we need to represent our text as numbers in order to utilize the supervised machine learning algorithms on them. So the question is really, how can we go from this, this is an article about the Hull City, the football club, to this, a mathematical representation of the same article. And if you go uh, to the internet and search for uh, how to represent text as numbers, you will probably end up in a tutorial that explains it to you about bag of words. And bag of words is a really simple algorithm that can help you transform text to numbers. So this is the first step of the algorithm. It's to let every unique word in the corpus get a feature in a vector. And I will explain to you what that means. So let's say, first, the corpus is a collection of documents. It's their entire, and for us, it would mean the entire collection of all uh, news articles published on nrk.no. But in this simple example, let's say we have three really short articles. First one, NRK produced TV and radio. Second one, football is popular on TV. And last one, NRK is popular in the population. And if you look at all the unique words in all these three articles, we get a list of words. And that's the unique words in the corpus. Then we can take all those words, string them together, uh, and get and build a feature vector. So which means in this vector, every unique word in the, uh, in the corpus 
has one index in this array, or one feature in this vector. So when we have that representation, we go back and then we say, for each document, count the number of times a word is used and fill it in the vector. So if we go back to the first article, NRK produced TV and radio, then we count the number of times the word NRK is present, count the number of times produced TV radio, and fill it in. And then we can do the same for other, other articles as well. And now we have this. These are mathematical representations of the content uh, of the content of the articles. And we refer to these art, uh, vectors as article embeddings because they try to embed the meaning of the articles in a vector representation. But there's one big problem with bag of words, and that is that articles about the same topic don't necessarily contain the exact same words. So, uh, on the left here, again, some traces of Norwegian. Uh, this is just to show you that uh, articles about the same topic. In this example, it's about crime. So, politi is police in Norwegian. And all these words are about, uh, it's police, police car, the police, police house, uh, police horse, and so forth. And because in Norwegian we tend to not put a space between the words and show them, take them together, uh, they will get a different, all of these words will get a different spot in this vector. Which means that if one article is, talks about the police and the other talks about the police car, the, the vectors are not similar. And the same thing for all those other words which, which could be named, could be used in an article about crime. Uh, but they won't necessarily have the same type of vector. So, uh, at NRK, we decided that we can do better than BAO. We can do something that's better than bag of words. <coughs> so, I'm sorry. We created a recipe for better article embeddings. And I will go through each and every step on the way to get get us to better article embeddings. But first, I want to stop and talk a bit about some Google technologies we use. Uh, we build most of this stuff in uh, Google Cloud. And uh, the main source of our data is Google BigQuery. And Google BigQuery is uh, a database in the cloud, which is the ex uh, exact opposite of the Cosmos DB we talked about earlier. BigQuery is relational. BigQuery is really, really slow uh, uh, when you do sh small queries. So almost any query you do to BigQuery will use like one second to respond. But Google BigQuery is really, really fast when, uh, when querying large amounts of data. So if you query terabytes of data, it will still only use uh, like 10 seconds. So it's for really good for batch processing of large amounts of data. And we use it as a data source. But you should never use it as a backend for your web app. Uh, then there's uh, Cloud Dataflow. It's a batch uh, processing uh, framework built on uh, uh, Apache Airflow, which is an open source standard for uh, pipe uh, processing. And uh, Dataflow can use Google BigQuery as a data source. I'll get back to that later. Then there's Cloud Data Proc, which is also uh, another data processing framework that Google supplies. Uh, the main difference between Data Proc and Dataflow is Dataflow is uh, like almost, we talked about serverless earlier as well. With Dataproc, you need to manually create a Dataproc cluster and submit your uh, uh, computational job to it and then delete the cluster afterwards. With Dataflow, you just submit the job, submit some code to a service, and then uh, Google itself will scale the job for you. So there's some different, we use them for different purposes. And of course, there's some traditional blob storage and Google Cloud storage. So I'll talk a bit more about all of these later, because we need them in our recipe. 
the first step will be to create the nrk.no corpus. And actually, if we were going to do bag of words, we would still need to do this. So the corpus is every article on nrk.no that was ever written. Uh, that's approximately 1.2 million ar news articles. So we take all those articles and we need to clean it. Because the articles contain HTML tags, numbers, special characters, uh, and things we don't need in a feature vector. And we also remove stop words, which like some Norwegian again, I, you, we, are, that. You may know this from uh, search, from search tech. Um, these words don't carry much meaning. It wouldn't, they're in almost every article, don't carry that much meaning. So they wouldn't say much about uh, deciding which topic an article is about. And then we do some simple entity detection. So, uh, and what, when I say simple, I mean really simple. We basically look for words with capital letters in sequence. So New York will be new underscore York. And the reason for this is that we want New York to be considered as one token. Because if we didn't do this, if you look back to that bag of words uh, vector, you would get new, and you would, if you had read this in a, had this in an article, we get new as one word and York as the other word. Uh, and we wouldn't, didn't really capture the meaning of New York. And that's, and when we do this, it's really good for when talking about person. Anna Solberg is the prime minister of Norway. Petter Solberg is a famous Norwegian rally driver. So without concatenating these uh, strings, uh, we would see a pattern between rally and politics, which is not really there. So this is just an example of an article before and after cleaning. And we built this using BigQuery. We read articles. We have all articles stored in BigQuery. Uh, and we run a data flow, a batch data flow job, which cleans the article and writes the result to cloud storage. So this is some code. We do all our coding in Scala. Um, it's just really simple. This is how you build a data flow pipeline. So you st create a pipeline, and you see the first job is to read articles from BigQuery. And then you can see here, this just references an uh, SQL query. And then for each row from that result, pardu in parallel extract the clean corpus. And then for each result, write that as a new line to a text file. So the result of this is uh, a text file in Google Cloud Storage with every article cleaned. Okay, first step is done. Next step is to find word embeddings. So this is where we start differing from what uh, we do with bag of words. So what we, when we, what we do when we find word embeddings is uh, we try to find a mathematical representation of words first before finding the mathematical representation of an article. So there's a lot of uh, well-known libraries for this. word to vec came from first from Google, and then Facebook built on top of that, built something called Fastex. There's also something called Glove. And now I will explain to you what I mean by word embedding. It's basically that the algorithm attempts to find patterns and correlation between words. So your words that are often used together in a sentence, that are close to each other in documents, will uh, be considered similar and will be placed close to another in a vector space. So this is a really stripped down example. I've written out four words, politics, government, football, and Barcelona. And this, and the output of our word embedding algorithm might look something like this. So you get uh, one vector for each word, which places words of similar meaning close to each other in the vector space. So politics and government is close to each other, and football and Barcelona is close to each other. Uh, and then we can do math, math on it. We can use 
a cosine similarity, a measurement between vectors to see which words are similar. And then if you run cosine similarity between politics and government vector, you get a high value. And if you run it uh, computed for politics and football, you get an extremely low value. So it shows that uh, it shows that similar words have similar, yeah, are, have similar cosine similarity. But the word embedding is not two-dimensional, like in that example. It's actually really high. In our case, we have 100-dimensional uh, space. And that's really hard to visualize on a slide. So this is the closest I could get. But what you will, if you take a look at those words and how they are uh, grouped together, uh, it will look something like this. You may get some uh, politics words clumped together, some sports words, winter sports, football, uh, something about fishing, and so forth. Words about the same topic are grouped together because they are used in the same type of sentences, in the same type of articles. And that's something we can use. When we've built it, we've built it using uh, FastText, the open source uh, uh, word embedding algorithm by Facebook. FastText also offers pre-trained models for over 150 languages, and the pre-trained models are trained with Wikipedia data. So when we first started out, we started with using the Wikipedia model. Turned out uh, Wikipedia articles are written in a different way than news articles. So it didn't match completely what we were trying to achieve. So it, we decided to train our own, and that's actually really simple. It's just an executable. You give in a corpus file, set some parameters, it runs for an hour, and you get back word embeddings. You should all try it, it's actually really fun. When we do it in our pipeline, we do this on Google as well. You just read the corpus. Last step, we store the corpus on cloud storage. Now we read it back from cloud storage. We run the fast text executable in a data proc cluster and write the results back to cloud storage. So this is just to show you, for data proc, in the other, in the other slide, the other code slide, you just created a pipeline, and Google did the rest. Here we actually need to create a cluster, submit a job, a jar file to that cluster, uh, and then delete it afterwards. It's a bit more maintenance. OK. We have word embeddings, and now we want to do some clustering on them. We see here that some words belong together. And what happens when you run a clustering algorithm on the output from uh, a word embedding algorithm is that you get clusters like this. So you will see that words that are similar or used in the same context will be put in the same clusters. So if you take these clusters of words and try to write them out a bit nicer, we can see something like this. So in this example, and for the rest of the presentation, we talk about these eight clusters. We have the one with politics, the one with sports, winter sports and football and fishing and some other, some other topics. But you will also see clusters like this. And these are words that are used in all types of articles. Uh, the word embedding algorithm is struggling to place them. Uh, they're often grouped together, and you get some strange clusters with words that don't actually carry much meaning. In our real system, we have uh, 400 clusters. Uh, one feature about these clusters is that they are not assigned a name by the algorithm. Like it's just it's just numbers, which are grouped vectors that are grouped together. But if we as humans look at it, it's easy to see that some clusters are about specific topics, like winter sports and science and food. Uh, and we built this using Apache Spark. Apache Spark is uh, a framework from Apache used for distributed, efficient distributed computing. It has a library called MLib in it, 
which you can do for using doing machine learning tasks, like for instance clustering. And we use the k-means clustering algorithm. Same as before, read from cloud storage, run a data proc job, write result back to cloud storage. Okay, last step. The thing is that we can use these word clusters to create article embeddings that are hopefully better than the bag of words vectors. So, let's say we have three articles. First one, three very short articles. First one, Nortug and Kowalczyk enjoy skiing and fruit. Fisherman prefer swimming fish, and science shows that salmon is fish. It's in Norway at least, that's true. And we have those clusters from before. And now we can match the word in the article with clusters. So we take the first word, we see Nortug. Oh, it's in that light red cluster. And it's from over here, Kowalczyk, enjoy skiing and fruit. And we do the same for our other two sentences as well. So this is mostly green. This one as well. And then you can take those words of the same color and stack them on top of each other, like this. And now you can see that this actually resembles a bar chart. And if we convert this to percentages, we can say that this short article is 43% about winter sports, 14% about food, and 43% about something undefined. And we, yeah. And then if you just look at those percentages, you see that we have a new article embedding. Uh, and this article embedding is a lot shorter uh, than the one we would have to do if you would just look at all the words in a, in a corpus. With bag of words, our corpus has around 300,000 words. So that, uh, that article embedding will be 300,000, uh, have 300,000 features. But in, in this case, but in this example, we only have eight features because we had eight clusters. But in our uh, real application, we have 400 clusters. So we have 400 features in this embedding. And we do the same thing for the other two articles. And now we have new article embeddings. And this thing is not a problem anymore because these words, all these words about police, they're clustered in the same cluster. So if you write an article about a police car and another art article about a police horse, they will both increase the number in the same uh, feature of the vector. And that will happen with most of those words as well. So now we can do some math on the articles as well. We can measure the cosine similarity between this one and uh, Nortug and Kowalczyk one with the one about fishing and see that it, uh, 0 0.21, it's not that similar. And if we uh, check the similarity between the two ones about the ocean, we get a quite high score, which means that similar articles have large cosine similarity. Now you might ask, won't the strange undefined cluster be a problem? Uh, and the answer is actually not but I'll get back to why a bit later. Okay, so we now have article embeddings, where similar articles have similar vectors, similar articles are close in vector space, and similar articles have large cosine similarity. So how did we build this? It's a bit more uh, complicated, because now there's four systems involved, but still, at first, uh, we have a data flow job which reads all the word embeddings and the cluster definitions from cloud storage. And then it reads all ad articles from BigQuery. Then it computes the new article embedding and writes the results to cloud storage. So more code. Remember, this is data flow. So all I need to do is, this is actually the same query from that we referenced from us from the, the first slide. We run a big query select, which returns one row for each article, and then we do a flat map. So for each article, 
compute the cluster using the fast text embeddings uh, and save the result. So there's actually not that much code there, which is a bit surprising. And now the articles embeddings are served so we can move on to the supervised learning. Um, I'm going to read your sentence. It's a bit long, so I'm going to have a sip first. So, if we know what categories we want and have examples of articles in these categories, then we can use machine learning to train the computer to understand what characterizes articles in each category and then assign a category automatically for new articles that we write. So I'm going to talk about all these things marked in yellow in turn. So, what cat categories do we want? <laughs> well, we made a list of, first we made a list of the articles that we would want to have to represent the content on our web page. And we took a look at something called the IPTC news categories. It's like a news standard for what, what type of topics there is out there. And that is like four, 1,400 uh, different topics. And then we looked at the content we have, the type of news articles we write, and selected the most fitting ones. Um, but to do supervised learning, you need examples. Right? Uh, we need examples of articles in the categories we want. And like I said in the introduction, we do have some collections of articles. They're not all very good, but some of them are good. And some of them actually map to the categories we wanted. So we all, for instance, we have a cross-country skiing article collection today. So we can take that article collection or use it as training data for our supervised learning algorithm. And when it comes to these duplicates, we can just merge them together and say all of these articles can be used as training data for the new category fishery. And the result of combining what we wanted and what we had training data for was around 82 categories. It's been going a bit up and down. But uh, when I updated the slide today, it was 82. So this means that when we have these articles, same as before, but now as article embeddings, then we can just look at what article collection some journalist put on that article once and use that as the tra label, as a training data. The top one is about cross-country skiing, the other one is about fishery. And that is our training data set. And with a training data set, you can do supervised learning. You can take that training data set, which is examples that the algorithm will learn from. So uh, basically, you take the training data set, give it to an algorithm, which turns it, and you get out a category model, which you can use to predict results, uh, predict uh, categories for new articles like this. So when a journalist publishes a new article, we can apply the category model to it, and then we get a predicted article category. And this is the first, first time we didn't use any Google technologies, actually. This runs on the laptop of our data scientist, which use R for most of their work. Uh, we tried a bunch of different al algorithms. We ended up with using multinomial logistic regression. Uh, I think this, we can, yeah, that talk earlier about using all the new fancy technology. M multinomial logistic regression is really, really old. So we don't need any fancy deep learning neural networks to do this kind of supervised learning. This old it's basically statistics is enough to do what we want. And one interesting feature is that it gives a probability for each label, which means you give in an article and then you get back a set of probabilities that this is cross-country skiing or if this is about food or if this is about fishery. 
And now we can back, get back to that question from earlier. That won't this strange cluster be a problem? Uh, and it's actually not because the algorithm, because multinomial logistic regression uh, will minimize the impact of those features. Uh, and it will do that because those features are similar across all labeled examples. Let's just show you an example. This is a real cluster from uh, our system. And if you knew Norwegian, you would see that these words uh, don't carry much meaning about the topic. It's words like easy or bad or like and uh, really. And these kinds of words are used in all types of categories, or all types of articles across all types of categories. And that's what you see down here. Uh, this is every, each bar in this bar chart represents a category in the training data set. Uh, and the height of it says uh, how big percentage of the words in that category are in this cluster. So this cluster is represented in almost all of the categories. And if we compare it to another cluster, This stopped working. This one, which is about fish, you see that it's strongly represented in one of the categories, but not in the others. And the multinomial log logistic re regression will notice this and say that this is important when predicting. We don't care about this when predicting. So the problem solves itself. Yep. And then we do real-time classification. Uh, so we have a job. It's actually just an uh, app running on, in Kubernetes, running all the time. When you start it up, we read in the word embeddings. We read the cluster definitions. We read, the, uh, read in the logistic regression model. And what's really handy about the logistic regression model is that it's just uh, a number of coefficients. So even though we created it in R, we can read it in in Scala, no problem. It's just a formula. You need It's just a simple math uh, question. And then we have a queue. And every, for every new article that's published, you publish that article on a queue. And this job keeps churning on new articles. And then it does that whole recipe we talked about. It cleans it, it creates the word, uh, uses the word embeddings and the clusters to create an article embedding, then puts that through the uh, supervised uh, logistic regression model, gets a category, and then write that to an elastic server we have. And that elastic server can in time be used by our recommendation API in real time. So this is the entire pipeline of everything. There's a lot of Google technologies involved and some other open source stuff as well. Okay, so if I were you, uh, this is the question I would ask, how well does this actually work? So when you uh, do machine learning, you often want to compare what you're doing to a baseline. And the simplest baseline when doing classification is often taking a random pick. And if you were to uh, compare, uh, classify between, uh, a binary classification between two labels, if you pick at random, it would be like 50-50 if you got it right. Uh, but in this case, there's 82 categories. So if you were to pick one at random, it's 1 over 82, which is around 1.2%. Uh, our supervised test set has an accuracy of around 81%, which is good, but we think we should do even better. 81% means that four out of five articles is predicted correctly. Uh, so this is an example of an article that was predicted wrongly. Sorry for the Norwegian again, but this is a, an, an article about football, and our model predicted it as handball. And the reason for this is that these words 
are common words between handball and football. It's where like keeper, uh, the crossbar, loss, the match, the manager, the players. So of course, it's easy to, to mix those two together. But there's also some uh, football words here that are unique to football. So uh, a penalty kick uh, and a football cup, for instance, stands out. So the question is, why isn't this categorized as football? Because there's, yeah, there's some words that are common, but, but there's also some words that are unique to football. And the reason, it turns out, is that many of the football words are in the same clusters as the handball words. So in reality, it looks like this. Most of the words are common, and only one word is unique to football. And it turns out, algorithm wants to put it in the handball category. So one way to solve this was, to, was by trying to create better clusters. But it turns out we write about football and handball in the same way. Like when, when a journalist sits down to write an article about football or an article about handball, they use the same type of words, the same type of phrasing. So the words will be placed close to each other in the vector space, even though they're about different topics. So we need to find another way to separate them. Uh, and we came up with a really, really simple solution. We called it category override. And when, what we do is we just look for simple keywords in, each, uh, in the text, which can trigger a movement from one category to another. So in this case, we could look for the word football and then move the category from one, or move the, where we, what we predicted as from one to another. But the thing is that we only want this three keyword to trigger if the article was uh, predicted as handball in the first place. So it was about something completely different, then the keyword will not trigger. So if the article is classified as handball and a football trigger word exists, for instance like this, the football cup, that's the football trigger word, then move it to football. And then we do the same for other categories that we tend to mix up. Uh, and it's really easy to see when you just browse through the articles, you will spot patterns of articles that are mixed up and then go back and look at the clusters we've made. They often mix up because uh, the words are in the same clusters. So what we really have done is by moving away from bag of words and using this cluster uh, approach instead, we introduced some other problems like this. No, we did not. And what I might also say that in addition to the trigger words, we have something we call safe words. So if the article is classified as humble and we find the trigger word football, then we take one step back. Is, is there a handball safe word here? For instance, the word handball and then we will not move it. Um, so we have around, it's not much, I think we have around 100, 150 trigger words between different categories. And when applying that, we went from 81 to 88% accuracy for a really, really non-machine learning simple solution. Which is good, but we ask ourselves, can we approve it even further? And we came up with something else. So this is another article that was wrongly predicted. It was predicted as, or categorized as crime, but it's actually uh, an article about kids that are being scared by scary videos on Snapchat. And a policeman was interviewed, so that's probably why it was uh, categorized as crime. But the thing is that the mo model was only 9% confident about this, because we get that confidence back, right, from the model. So we can utilize that. So we set the threshold on 20%. So if the confidence is lower than 20%, then we don't use the fine prediction model. We use another model, a coarse model, of only six categories. So in this coarse model, we don't separate between football and handball and skiing. We just have one coarse category, which is sports. 
So you can say that it's a bit of cheating, but at least we make sure that um, uh, we make sure that uh, it's not categorized wrongly. It's better to put it in sports than to be not be sure if it's football or handball. Uh, yeah, so if we use that as well, we get 90% accuracy. And then you might ask, is 90% good enough? <laughs> 9 out of 10 articles, is that good enough? So, to determine if it's good enough, we actually try to let two humans categorize the same articles. So we had all articles that was published during a week, 450 of them. Then two of the people in my team, each of them sat down on their own, tried to categorize the same articles using the same 82 labels, and they only agreed on 93% of them. So it turns out it's not just hard for the computer to categorize, it's hard for humans as well. And the reason for this is, of course, if there was an article about a football player which was went to vacation uh, to the United States and broke his leg. Is that an is a, a article about football? Which is an article about tourism? Or is it an article about medicine? So it's up to the reader to decide that. And it turns out that the, the articles that the computer struggles with is the same type of articles that we humans might be not agree on. So, we are happy with this 90% confidence, 90% accuracy. Okay, so what's next for us? Well, this automatic categorization, it gives us a uniform article categories on the same level of abstraction, and there's no longer any duplicate definitions. We save time for our journalists. Uh, we have removed one purpose from those article collections we have today, so they can be more clean in their usage. Of course, it's still going to take some time to learn the journalists to use it this way. And categories can and will be used to build user profiles, which in turn can be used to give personal recommendations in the future. So this guy will get something, some different use on the top of our uh, front page than this old woman. And that's it. And I'm happy to take questions. In front. Of you. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it is. It's the second the biggest export industry after oil. We read, write a lot. No, but maybe she is, and he's not. And now we can. <laughs> Personalized on it. There was a question back here. Yeah. We tried, yeah, we did try to use TF IDF at some point. Uh, it didn't affect it very much. No, actually not. But that's because the clusters already capture a lot of that. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> so I didn't say that the humans were right in 93%. I just said that they agreed on 93%. So you could say that uh, one of them was right, and then the other one should try to guess. And in that context, he would only be 93% correct. Yes? Yeah, okay, so we asked what I do about new categories. Well, 
uh, we don't have that granular categories that we would have a new one for a new uh, new artist. But we we don't have the category Donald Trump, but <laughs> we do have something else. Let's see if this loads. Uh, it probably won't. My VPN is not always that good. Ah, okay. But what we actually do as well is we parse for entities. So in the football uh, football category, we have a list of football entities that we look for, which is basically football clubs. So you will look for Manchester United and Arsenal. Okay, that's why it didn't work. We will look if the category is, uh, if the article is predicted as football, then we will look, scan through the text and look for Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea. And we, are plan we do that for football and we do that for politics. We don't do it for any other categories because we think it's important to be able to follow your team if you're interested in football. But we're thinking about doing the same thing for artists, just scan texts if it's Categorized at music, which is a category we have. We can scan the text for music entities. But that changes every day, so it will be hard to... You will probably need to use a list from somewhere else. But since it's not in the model, it will be easy to refresh it. Okay, I think I'll give up on this one. Is there one last question? Yeah. Okay, so the question is about if you use only single categories or multiple categories. Yeah, sure. So, uh, what we have... I don't have any slides on it. What we have uh, tried to do... So, when you predict, you get a, a confidence out. The confidence, and the confidence to predicting it as football might be 90%. So what we tried, we have tried doing this is saying a rule that we give it the top cat predicted categories. We get back a list, right? So we get something like it's 30% crime, 20% uh, fishery, for instance. Maybe someone stole a fish, and then and then we can uh, create a rule that says apply, give it all the labels, give it all the categories for which the confidence added together comes above 60%, for instance. So if it then was 30% crime, 30% fish, yeah, it's about 60%. We give it both of those. Yeah, sure. So one approach we tried to do to improve this, because we didn't actually really like having those manual, as a data scientist, having those trigger words. It's not pretty. It looks really stupid, actually. But it turns out it works. So what we tried to do was take those trigger words and put them as additional factors in the vector. So you would have the 400 first uh, features in the vector was clusters, and then we added those identified trigger words, 
as new features in the vectors, which will then be a part of the logistic regression model. And that performed worse than it improved it by only like, no, I'm sorry, it decreased the accuracy by like five to eight percent because it confused the model. Okay, I think I'm done. We can talk later. I'll be around. <laughs> okay. Thank you.